can see that we do have special music. But then the congregation gets going and they really enjoy themselves. Churches up country, and I want to now give you uh, give you some idea of what their churches they came from. We were just incredibly just blown away by the singing in the churches up in Upper Egypt. Um, the people at the front you're going to see is the the um, the song leader, the the pastor, uh, an elder, and uh, oh, another song leader and an elder. All of them staunch. Um, leaders in the church in Egypt, and they're they're in charge of the the um, they're in charge of the music that day. Enjoy. So you can you can see that our song singing at the academy is not so bad. Actually, those pictures of the church are a little bit deceptive because of modern technology and modern cameras. They get they multiply the light a lot. Actually, it's more like this. Um, I think if we could get a little bit less light at the front, it would be good. Could someone 
work on that. Um, because it, because the projector is low in its, in its, in its uh, power, they turn all the lights off while they watch the video clips, which are the ones with things that they seem to, and then they turn them back on again whenever there's anything in between. So we switch from being in a, in, a, in a cave to being in full light, to being in a cave to being full light the whole of the, whole of the service. Um, and one of the things I'd really like to bring to them is a powerful projector so that we can keep the lights on, we can see each other's faces while we, while we worship. Mm. Um, I did order one from the States. It was sent to Berrien Springs. It waited there three months. Somebody brought it to Lebanon. From Lebanon, they brought it to Egypt. And we put it up on the ceiling and it didn't work. Mm. <laughs> so I sent it back now and I sent it back through someone to, to somewhere in, in Chicago. They sent it back to Amazon. Amazon sent it back to the company. And they gave the money back to my bank again. <laughs> and now I'm ready to start again. So I'm hoping sometime to fix this up. Any of you would like to help me with a projector, that would be wonderful. Anyway, after church, just to show that we are real. Um, there's Karen there, greeting the students. Um, we do feel like... Um, we do know all the students. We know them by name, then we know them by character, and we are able to... Uh, relate to them well. I, when I was giving greetings before, I offered to give a holy kiss to, to the men, but nobody was taking me up on it. Uh, men will kiss each other uh, with touching their, their bearded face on the side and making a sound in the ear on three sides. I offered to do it to Paul, but he wasn't in for it today. Um, but it becomes quite normal to you, and you become... So you can see Karen on the, on, the, on the left there is giving a kiss to all the girls as they come out. Uh, they, well, as I, I was going around with my camera, taking some pictures, I said, I'm going to take some pictures to show to you guys today. Uh, two Sudanese did a special one just for you. Wow. No Sudanese would do it except someone who knew Koreans. Wow. <laughs> Uh, these people are worth adopting. Um, let me tell you a kind of, uh, a, one of the complications, like we have a farm that's, that is now contracted out to, uh, to uh, an alumni of the school and he's making very good progress bringing it up to, up to standard. Uh, already um, he's um, to changed it from flood irrigation to, to sprinkler irrigation, which really saves the electricity. Uh, we have sheep now. We have uh, a chicken farm. The building is built now. There will be 10,000 chickens very soon on the chicken farm. Um, I'm starting an apiary for bees that will begin as soon as we get back. Many things are happening, many jobs for students. But there are still cultural issues and cultural problems. Now, for, for years, it's, felt it's been punishment to work on the farm, and nobody wants to work on the farm. Everyone finds excuses. They've got sore backs. They've got, they've got letters from their doctors up in, up in Upper Egypt that they've bribed to say that they can't work on the farm. And uh, everyone is trying to get off the farm. Now, one of the guys um, has, probably has a bad back and I've asked the farmer please to give him gentle work until we can get the full medical checkup on him to see whether he has a, a back spine problem. Uh, we have a very good uh, nurse on campus from Australia and she will evaluate the doctor's report and then she'll get another doctor if necessary because uh, everyone wants to get off the farm. Anyway, uh, on the first day, I, I, the night before, I called all of these guys that I knew didn't want to go on the farm, talked to them like a Dutch uncle, and told them that, uh, don't forget, the farmer is the one that's paying your scholarship to send you to Middle East U U uh, University very generously, and he's come to do the farm now to help the school. Work along with him, because this is the man that's going to look after you for your education. And they said, yes, yes, we would do it. Then next day, when he went to the farm, they were picking up the, um, the branches that had been pruned off the orange orchard. There's a beautiful orange orchard there with very good tangerines. 
and this guy was was he was had to work so he's working but he's picking up the smallest twigs possible and walking very slowly and putting them in the tray at the back of the donkey then going back again obviously the farm manager was not really impressed by it so he said to him that's not working he said if I'm moving I'm working um, and uh, a few of the younger guys were following him, doing this exaggerated, <laughs> slow, twig at a time job. And of course the farm, farm manager got upset and said to them, if you don't want to work on the farm, then just, I don't care, you don't have to work on the farm, just go off the farm. And uh, anyway, uh, in the process of it, as he got upset, one of the students decided to just calm him down and said to him, it's okay, uncle, it's okay, uncle, we're not, we're, not, we're not pushing your buttons too much. And the man said, I'm not your uncle, I'm not your father, I wouldn't want to be. Uh, I'm your boss, so get to work. And then the uh, upper Egyptians got very upset because calling someone an uncle is a, is a very great honor. And they just honored him and he'd, he'd turned down the honor. And uh, they were really angry and were shouting so that the uh, supervisor of the farm came over and went to talk to the guy that was shouting the most and one of the other students grabbed him by the arm, held him back to stop him hitting the other guy, which he wasn't going to do and which was a really unknown no for a student to hold back an adult by the arm to stop them doing whatever they have to do it was a problem that you... there was no solution for the problem, it just escalated mm -hmm. so what we do in that sort of situation, we talk to the students and say do you accept that you're wrong and they wouldn't accept that they are wrong and they said he insulted our, 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 um, our um, honor of him and all the rest of it so I said you don't accept it's wrong then you need to go home and get your parents or somebody important bring them to school and we'll talk together with you and if, if at the end of time your parents say you were wrong you weren't wrong I'll accept that you weren't wrong and so at that stage things broke into a great a great issue, having to be sent home. One boy was crying and shouting in his room for an hour, saying that this was the end of his life and didn't I care that his father would kill him if he went home and all the rest of it, which was a huge exaggeration. His father was in Kuwait and wasn't going to kill him that day. Um, so uh, in the end, they, he called his brother who was in America and his brother is in America called me and I asked him if, if anyone in the family could come down and see us and he said the mother was alone, she couldn't come down so I said okay I will drive you home to see your parents 700 kilometers, get in the car now we're gonna go so I drove 700 kilometers that night got to their village and stayed, slept for about four or five hours met, met the parents and the uncles and everybody else the next day and sat down together and they all said to the boys, you boys are wrong, you can't do that. Even in our culture you can't do that. You are wrong, wrong, wrong. So I said, okay, uh, you've told them they're wrong now. Uh, do you want me to leave them with you so you can beat them up for a week and, and send them down to me when they've finished or will, will they come back with me? No, no, they'll come back with you. So on the way back, uh, they were very subdued and, and they're, they're actually very, very very subdued by the fact that I would travel so far to solve the problem. I gave them driving lessons on the way back, so it really made me really somebody special. And we got back to the campus and uh, within a day or so, both of them had given apologies and uh, had, ex had expected they were wrong and the whole spirit on the farm turned around and there was no longer any rebellion about working on the farm. So it was really worth the effort to make that, that effort. These are leaders uh, in, the, in the resistance to working on the farm. The farmer came good, the farm supervisor came good too with rewards for good students. Next time we had an awards day, he gave money in, hand, money in, the, in an envelope to all the good workers and everyone's now enthusiastic to be on the farm. And we've solved the problem, but right at that point I thought the there's going to be a complete rift between farm and students and they'd go and hire outside people, we would have no work for the students and all the scholarships would fade and it would be the end of the program. So uh, that's the kind of thing we have to do. But they are worth it, they are worth adopting 
they are worth uh, helping. Now, just, to th just so that I can be consistent with being uh, a missiologist, I'm not going to keep leave you in Egypt. I'm going to bring you back to Korea. Uh, I was fortunate to walk in on Pastor uh, Do when uh, he was watching the tail end of a movie the other night. And I want, you to, want to show you a part of it. It's a movie called Approved for Adoption. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's a 2012 movie. It's an autobiography. It's a, it's a story that uh, a, a Korean tells about his adoption to Belgium and uh, the hard time he had and the hard time he gave as he was growing up as, a, as an orphan in a far country. Um, and it's called a proof for Adop adoption. His life changed from the time someone wrote on his, in, in, in the orphanage where he was, that he was approved for adoption. Uh, he was sent across to, to live with a family. A family uh, took them, him into the home. They already had three children and they added him. Later they had a little girl from Korea at a time when he was really quite popular to take Korean orphans. And a hard time that he had uh, accepting that he was really loved, that he really was okay, that he avoided to all the other as Korean orphans in the town because they all were pretending they were not all Koreans or they were didn't know what they were. But in the end, this is a little scene I want to show you where things turn around. Um, so we're going to go switch to, to a movie now just for a minute. Didn't believe he was loved and didn't believe that anything was good and life was pretty terrible for him. He got quite sick, he was looking after himself, he was feeding himself on rice and Tabasco and after a while that, that did damage to his stomach and uh, he had to be taken to hospital. When he came home, his mother, his adopted mother, um, said there's something that I wanted to tell you for a long time. I lost my first child at birth. And I think I've given you his place in my heart. I've never told that to anyone before. The mother had lost a, a child at, at birth and then she went to Korea and, and brought a child back to take his place. And he'd never known that he was taken as a, as a, a substitute for her own real child. And he says, I knew then that I had a place, I knew that I had a place in the family but I didn't know that I had one in her heart. I wasn't a rotten apple after all. And our task uh, at the school is to let these Egyptian young people into our hearts. That's the biggest job we have to do. So that they do feel we care about them as individuals. We, we like them, we care about them. And we, we, are, we are concerned helping them to develop their character. Um, they know they're in a church school, they know they're in a church. We just let them know that they're not rotten apples after all, that we care for them anyway, uh, enough to take them 700 kilometers to try to sort out their problem. Um, we didn't ask these young people to come into the strange world. We didn't ask the children to come in the strange world of NUA, of Noah Union Academy. And to have dreams of grandeur, they cannot achieve. The people who were recruiting students a, uh, a few years ago, there were few students, they went and promised the world to, to families, we will look after your children forever, they'll never have to pay any money, we'll send them overseas for, for education. They came with great expectations that can't be achieved. And so they are, they are, we, our job is to help them face up with reality, help them find a place to be at the end, the end of their education, help them get into uh, universities and schools in, in the country, because they, most of them can't afford the dream that they've been having all of their, their time. Um, they, that they can't love an imaginary mum. You can only dream about her. What they need is a real and permanent mother and that permanent mother 
I believe, is God. We'll never be enough for them. We're only temporary, even if we give our hearts and everything to them. I think already there's a there's quite a difference in the in the in the spirit of the school because we're there, but we're only there temporarily, and then we'll move on like we've moved on from here and everywhere else. All of us are just temporary moving on, unless we can attach them to to God. Uh, we haven't given any solution. Even those young boys who came back and, and changed and became better people, they won't be better people forever unless they give themselves to God and God will make them different from inside. Uh, the, the external love from people and care from people, when that moves away, they'll slip back to be what they were before. The best thing we can do is to, is to tell, is to convince them they already have a mum and her name is God. And God is real. When God looks at them, his eyes won't lie. His eyes are those of a mother and a father looking at their son and their daughter. There's somebody that they can depend on. What to teach them? The best we can do is to get them to, to the place where they can say, I come from here and elsewhere. I am all kinds of people. I'm from Upper Egypt, I'm from NUA, I'm from everywhere. I'm, I'm, I'm from everywhere. It doesn't matter. I came from Cairo, Alexandria, from Upper Egypt, from Sudan. That doesn't matter. I now am at Nile Union Academy. Part of me is Western, part of me is Middle Eastern or African. And I'm both. I'm neither black nor white. The color of my skin is God's color. Amen. God has predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Amen. Before that it says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. And it says after that, To the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one that he loves. So my message today is for you is to live as if you've been adopted. Live as if you've been adopted by someone who really loved you, who has a place in, in their heart for you, and that's God. And adopt those who need adopting. Make room in your heart for those who are struggling with their identity, who they are, and whether they are loved, whether they uh, this or that, whether the color of their skin is honey, the color of their skin is, is uh, Sudanese or Egyptian or Korean or, or whatever, whatever you are. Um, adopt those who need adopting and give them a place in your heart because that's the best thing you can do. But in the end, transfer their love, their, their identity, their dependence to God and don't leave it with yourself and you will have done the best thing that you can do for other people. And God bless you as you do your ministry for your people and ask for your prayers as we do our ministry for the, <coughs> for the young people of Egypt. Amen.
a place in your heart for us. Amen. As we help us to have places in our hearts for others, particularly those who are not sure that they're loved by anybody, help us to be have a heart big enough to adopt those who need adopting. Yes. And I ask your blessing on all of these good people here as they serve you, as they care for their families, as they as they do do faithfully their work in their various occupations. Be with them all and help us all to be ready to see you when Amen. when you come. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.